have, you know. And welcome to another episode of the Smoke and Tobacco Show. I am Matt Tobacco from SmokeandTobacco.com, and I'm joined again by my friend, Mr. Jonathan Carney from Hacking Gourmet and La Flor Dominicana. And we have a guest with us tonight, another person from La Flor Dominicana. We have Tony Gomez from LFD. Tony, what's going on? Doing all right, man. Doing all right. Just, uh, uh, it, it's a crazy day, huh? Uh. <laughs> I just got so, so much could be said. <laughs> <laughs> so much can be said. I, I you know what? I, I just we try not to get too into it on the show. I I don't know. It, it's it's I guess, happening though. But this is a nice break from it, you know? Yeah. I mean it's Look, it's. I don't think any of us expected it to be this wild. I think we all knew that it, this election was going to be different. I think we knew that this election was going to be very unconventional. We didn't really know what to expect. I think some people thought it was going to be a landslide on both sides of the table. Yeah. Um, some of us did think it was going to be close. I don't know if anyone thought it was going to be this close. Um, but again, I think the whole mail-in ballot thing is really what's shaken this thing up. You know, you have the the delay to count them. Now there's people fighting over the legitimacy of those votes. Uh, I don't know. I and mean, this isn't a political show, but there is so much we could say about it. I mean, I... <laughs> this is going to stretch on for a long time. This is going to stretch on for a long time. Yeah. Oh, I know. This is going to be all over the news. This isn't going to be over today. This is not even going to be over like in three weeks. This is going to be going on. And who, 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 I don't know. Who even knows if in well, you know, the about. thing that's really interesting about the whole the whole thing is how everyone actually knew about it. Like, I've talked to so many people outside. Forget about what's going on in the media where they're like, oh, it's going to come down to this state, that state, this state. Nobody has any clue what's going on. And then I talk to people out in the real world, um, and they don't really know either. And then there's so-called experts that it's going to go like this, it's going to go like that. Now what we're going to watch is over the next couple of weeks, let alone what happens with the actual election, um, is we're going to have people be like, well, I told you so. The gloaters, the ones that, oh, this is what I thought. There's nobody in the planet that thought it was going to be like this. I hadn't heard this scenario um, mentioned other than just in fun where, hey, it could be really close or it could be almost a tie. Um, that, that's not a real scenario that was discussed in any of the circles that I've been in or anything I've seen on TV. So we're going to get to see people to claim this. And I think that's the next big thing on social media is going to be of course. people called it. Of course. <laughs> yeah, you're going to have the, the – John's right. You're going to have the gloaters. You're going to have the people who are still going to protest no matter what, because for whatever reason, that like, even last TVs, night. There's a lot of new TVs out there. There's new models. Oh, yeah. There's there's, 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 uh, there's, there's stuff to be had. There's stuff to be broken and stolen. Uh, you know, you're going to have the, the people who are upset, the people who are gloating, the people who are rioting. It's just going to be a shit show. It doesn't matter what it is. It doesn't matter. It, just, it doesn't even matter, like, it, it, as it stands right now, if you if you live under a rock. Um, Biden is only six votes away from his 270. It's very close. It's looking as if he's going to win. However, there is a lot of battleground states that are, you know, still in play. Yeah, technically, I guess it's still anyone's game, um, depending on who you ask. So again, no matter how, no matter how these cards fall in the next few days, it's going to be a shit show. Doesn't matter who wins. Well, yeah. you know what? Be while, back, way, you know? Yeah, back at smoking tobacco. This is our Wednesday night debut. Mm -hmm. um, so our, the show has moved to Wednesday night, 7 o'clock uh, earlier time. Uh, a hump day is now our new day. Hump day. Um, yep, so w welcome to the Wednesday night smoking tobacco show. And, right. um, yeah, so this is a good test. Tony, thank you for coming on. Uh, I appreciate, uh, appreciate you being part of the show. Look forward to asking. I have a few questions I'm going to ask you about uh, your company's vice president of sales that we've been curious about here at the show. So looking I've forward to asking some guy. of those questions. Yeah, yeah. Love this, get, stuff. Is this, this is live, right? It doesn't get edited? Oh, no, this is live. Yeah, You're, this, yeah uh, we're live. All right. And then it's uncensored, too. So you can you can say what you want. Um, I, I did hear, though, that you guys have this this uh, this odd fellow that you have at the helm of your well, vice president. Before we get into the questions for, for Tony, <laughs> Tony is the vice president of production, manufacturing, yeah. Um, all sorts of things, new titles each day, does international distribution um, and the, essentially the coordination of the international business in LFD. But what is everybody smoking? Tony, what are you smoking tonight? 
Oh man, Carney hates me, and he's gonna get. He's <laughs> you know what? You know what? Don't even answer the question, Matthew. What are you smoking? You're, you don't have to show people. <laughs> I'm smoking. I'm smoking. I'm smoking the El Granu, um, from LFD. Fantastic cigar. Um, I like how th- this cigar has a lot of flavor. This is this is one of my newer favorites from LFD. I only started smoking them this year. Um, you know, thanks to John, who uh, said, "Hey, you gotta, you gotta try the El Granu," and I'm like, "Oh, okay." And I gave it a crack, and I was like, "Wow, I love this cigar. I like how it burns slow. It's a thicker ring gauge, um, and it but and it burns nice and slow." But uh, and it also draws very nice. Plenty of smoke production. It tastes great. This is definitely a, an easy go-to for me, especially from you know from LFD. I smoke a lot of LFD, but this is a this is a nice go-to for me. Um, I find I I can see myself smoking this one cigar over a long period of time. I can really enjoy it. Um, Tony, I know you you had mentioned before that there's a the blend on this is amazing and it's um, has a lot of um, sorry, I'm losing my train of thought here. It's no, been a long day. <laughs> no, we were talking. We were talking about the. We were talking about the slow burn on this, and you had mentioned that the uh, the blend makeup on this um, had a lot of tobacco in it, which really allows that to really burn nice and slow. A lot of tobacco, a lot of a lot of you know higher primings and thicker tobaccos. You know, it's it because you know it, it's easy to make a big ring gauge cigar and stuff it with you know some you know lower priming, some thin just just tobacco to fill it up. But you know then you're not going to get the same kind of kick that you'll get from a smaller ring gauge and, you know, it'll burn a lot quicker, but you know, we, we, we make big ring cigars. We make them to smoke the same way the, the, the thinner versions of those blends would smoke, you know, so we, we want them to still have the same amount of power and we want them to, to, to burn slowly. You know, we don't want to, uh, uh, we don't want to be cheap and cop out, you know? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I would say it's safe to say, most pretty much all of the cigars that you guys come out with at LFD, um, I don't think you guys you don't think you guys uh, cheap out on anything. I think all of your cigars are usually packed pretty well, they're rolled really well. The quality, I have to say, and again, this is no BS. And John and I will say this all the time because uh, he's on here, whatever. No BS. LFD is a great brand. You guys do have great quality. I have to say, you know, I, I smoke a lot of cigars. John smokes a lot. We all smoke a lot of cigars. You know, I have to say, seriously, great. Great quality on the cigars. I mean, there's a lot of other big brands out there who, you know, are bigger than LFD. And I'm not going to mention any names, but, you know, I would say, you know, your quality outdoes them. You know, the, you know, companies who are you know, more main, you know, bigger. And um, you guys are hitting it out of the park. I think you guys put out a better product than a lot of the other big players. And, you know, that's that's something to be said. I mean, that's something to be proud of. I mean, you can put out a good taste in cigar, but you got to have good quality, too. You know, it has to be an enjoyable smoke. So, so Tony... What are you? What are you smoking? All right, I, I will. I will ask the uh, the audience to please have mercy on my uh, my good friend and uh, and co employee, Mr. Jonathan Carney, because you can't buy this cigar. So uh, just don't don't message him. He can't sell it to you. You know, if you want one, you got to find me, and it's tough because we're in a pandemic. But this is a. Uh, you can see it there. This is a. Uh, the Andalusian Bull Blend, but in what I consider to be the perfect size for a cigar. It's a 41 by six and a quarter. Uh, you know, I, I, I just love the Bull Blend, but I don't, I don't really like big, big cigars like that. So I, you know, I, I just kind of had a, a <clears throat> one of these moments when the light bulb went off and I said, hey, I can make whatever the hell I want, right? So let me just make this cigar for myself. And uh, it's become like my favorite cigar in the world. So, so I've heard a lot about this because John's always telling me, he's like, oh, Tony's got these like Andalusian bulls, but like they're like just for him, but and it's not the standard size. And uh, so now I actually get to see it. <laughs> so so no, the, the issue, the issue with the cigar Don't is not call not Carney enjoyable. tomorrow. He can't sell it to you. <laughs> yeah, it's not that they're not enjoyable. It's not that I don't like the size. It's after every time I, I invite him to do anything um, that I'm involved in. It seems to be the only cigar that he has on him, um, which is great. It's become like 90% of the cigars I smoke is this, and I, 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 yep. I don't want to smoke anything else, you know? I don't know. It's perfect. Well, Fortunately, I mean, I, on my end, my screen on my computer uh, has actually gone black, so I didn't actually have to see or witness this. So uh, if, I, if, if I didn't see it, it didn't happen. But, uh, yeah, so it's there for now. But that's, that's the frustration with a great cigar. If you're ever at an event that Tony's at and we travel around, you can grab them from him. And no, the other question is, 
Oh, can you have him send you some? If he sends me some, it would entirely defeat the purpose uh, of the cigar. So, so tonight I'm smoking the uh, Double Arrow Chisel Maduro. This is the original from like 2004 slash 2005. Had this awesome. in my private stash. Still got a lot of strength to it. Pretty smooth. Uh, but a cigar that you also can't smoke. So I guess again, I'm no better because you can't get this one either. Uh, but the regular Chisel Maduro is still available. But this was something I've held onto for a long time. So I felt tonight so- was pretty important. So speaking of the chisel, we have a question from uh, Johnny Harris in the uh, comment section, and that's going to be, what is the best way, and you guys can both weigh on in this. We'll go to Tony first. What's the best way to cut the chisel? Well, that is that is a question of, uh, of great debate, but um, this is the way I see it, is if you're going to smoke a chisel, you don't want to... You can't ruin the shape, right? Or otherwise, it's pointless to smoke the chisels. You want to keep the shape, which means yeah. there's two ways to do it. Either you can pinch it, you just pinch the two little corners there, and the cap will pop off, or you could take a punch cutter and uh, punch a hole uh, on one side. Some people do it on both, uh, but one side is usually enough. It doesn't have to go all the way through. And just you know, however far the, the the punch goes. But you want to keep the shape of the chisel. So I would say either of those options are, are perfectly fine. Then it's up to really, it's really just personal preference from there. I've smoked it pretty much every way I think you can. Uh, the ways that are frowned upon as well as the, the, the ways you've just expressed. Uh, expressed. Uh, I have to say, I like the punch method. I really yep. do. I, I like the way that that smoke rolls in over the top. Hey, it's unique, man. It feels yeah. good. It really changes the experience. And and I would recommend anybody that's smoking the chisel or likes the chisel to at least try it. You know, if it's not if it's not your thing, great. But uh, you should give it a shot because it's something different. It's a, it it adds a new element to the experience. Absolutely. Um, so a little bit about let's let's talk about you for a minute. So how long have you been uh, in the cigar industry, and how long have you been working with LFD? Um, Oh, so uh, 2009, 11 years, 11 years now. Yeah. Okay. So it's, it's been a little while. So, you know, what's in, in your experience, you know, getting into scars and getting into the business, obviously a family business, you know, your dad, Tony, um, sorry, Tony, Lito, Lito Gomez, Inez Gomez, uh, another, you know, great family business you guys have going there, uh, like a common theme in the cigar industry. Uh, was it kind of one of those things where it was like, well, going to get into the family business or did you have any other, like, was there any other plans for you to do something completely un- non-cigar related? Sure. No, it, it, it actually, it wasn't my original plan, man. Um, I was actually, I was an English major in college with, uh, actually like English, but with an emphasis in writing. And I kind of had this whole idea where I was going to go to film school and study screenwriting. Um, and, uh, you know, cause my, my old man, he never, he never pressured me into it, you know. It, it was never a thing where like you have to join the company, you have to join the company. It was more, dude, dude, find something you love and do that, whatever it is. If that happens to be the family business, uh, you know, that'd be great. If not, uh, the important thing is that you find something that you love, you know. Uh, I, I don't think it was until probably my senior year of college where I really, really started to to think about. It. I don't think I thought much about my future either in college. I was con- <laughs> I was concerned with much more important things like parties and girls and all that, but uh, I, 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 I almost remember the moment. I, I'm pretty sure I'm pretty sure I was playing beer pong or something at the time. I just kind of had this moment of clarity. I was like, you know, if, if I don't at least try this, I would be stupid, you know? Because it, people don't just get opportunities like that in life uh, handed to them, so it, I, I felt like I had to try it, you know? Um, yeah. And so I said, you know what? I, I I called my dad, I think the next day or something, we had a talk, and I said I wanted to try it, and um, we went over different options, and we decided that I would start I would start on the road, so I started as a sales rep, um, actually during my senior year of college, I would go on weekends, I would drive to Florida State, so I would drive to Tallahassee, to Tampa, or to Jacksonville, or to Orlando, or whatever, and you know, visit accounts. And then uh, as soon as I graduated, it was it was out to the races. So I covered Florida as a sales rep for uh, four years. That's where I met Mr. Jonathan Carney. He was working at a, a great shop, great little shop in Orlando. Uh, he eventually started working for us, and he moved his way up. Yeah, after four years, I, I, I fell in love with the industry very quickly. 
unique. There's nothing like it. You know, the cigar business is, I mean, it's a tight knit group. Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. It's a tight knit group, and and you know that's a good thing and a bad thing. But I, I think the positives outweigh the negatives because it's such a small industry. It's like high school, you know. Yeah. Uh, and everybody knows everybody. Everybody knows everything about everybody. And you know, if you're an asshole, you, you get weeded out of the <laughs> industry very quickly. You don't you don't last that long. Uh, so that, that's a good thing. We kind of protect ourselves, but. Uh, so I did that for four years, but I think I really started to fall in love with what I do a little bit after that when I moved down to the Dominican Republic and I started working at the factory, uh, which I've been there for, for six, a little over, uh, maybe seven years now. Uh, and when I really got involved with like the creative aspects of things, you know, because I, I always wanted to be creative. And, yeah, it's funny, since you bring up the creative aspect, you know, John was uh, gracious enough to uh, show me. Hold on one second, John. I might have to uh, might have to mute you here for a second. Get some... There we go. Um, we, uh, yeah, so uh, I had seen uh, recently, you know, John did the, uh, the Gourmet Smoke Sessions event, and I have seen the, uh, the new Andalusian Bull paintings that you guys have. Uh -huh. uh, that are now out and you, you, the new uh, sh the new um, merchandise website that you yeah. guys just put out earlier this year and all the beautiful graphics on there and John was actually telling me you you made all that you actually you know being the creative guy you are you actually kind of came up with all those designs um, so is that kind of like something else that you have it's kind of like a hobby that's like your secondary thing you know your cigars is your everyday business obviously but you also have this this little creative outlet where you actually have been able to take that and bring it into the company as well. Sure, uh, I, I don't see them as separate things. You know, it, it's all it's all it's all the same thing to me. It's all part of what I do. You know, so yeah. Uh, but yeah, for you know, for for the last seven years or so, I've been really involved in the packaging design and you know the rings, the boxes, all those things. But I didn't know how to work Photoshop and Illustrator and all those things. So you know, I would have to sit down with a with a designer and tell them they do this, do that, put this here. You know. And uh, when the quarantine started and I didn't have anything to do, I actually said, you know what, let me just, I mean, let me just learn all this shit, you know, so I don't have to depend <laughs> on anybody. And, you know, designers are not easy to work with, you know, they, yeah. they like to show up on time or ever sometimes. And, you know, so I said, uh, I'm, I'm just going to, I'm going to bear down and I'm going to learn all this stuff. And uh, so I learned Photoshop and I learned Illustrator and now it's just good. the level of freedom it's given me is is amazing you know so now i can any idea i have i can create it myself i don't need to wait for anybody i don't need to depend on anybody and so you're going to see a lot more stuff like that coming out we're just getting started with that really yeah it's it's a unique feeling when you don't have to rely on someone else <laughs> i guess you could just or i'll do it myself mm -hmm. uh, like you said that definitely makes a difference uh no matter what it is if you can if you can learn something on your own and do it yourself and it's usually faster and it's easier and it's you always loss of a headache. Um, and you have some really cool stuff that I've seen. Uh, I know that you've been involved with a couple of the, the lines from LFD. I know you were involved with chapter one, chapter two, uh, the Lenox line, especially, uh, what would you say, you know, your favorite project is that you kind of, uh, oversaw at LFD so far? Um, my, well, chapter one is special just because it was the first one, you know, and it, Chapter one was just like a really, it was a really valuable learning experience for me. Um, you know, just going through the whole process of creating the blend and then the packaging and just learning all the ins and outs of the little details that you have to deal with. Uh, so it was a very memorable project. But Lenox was probably my favorite uh, up until this point. Uh, my current favorite project has not been released yet. Mm. Uh, so... And we had plans to release it much sooner, but uh, the, the the global situation right now has made it a lot more difficult. So that's it's all on pause. But my this is going to be my favorite project ever, and that that'll be released sometime next year. I, well, I can't say anything else about it. Yeah, I was just going to say I, I didn't think you would be able to say anything, but but you know we're excited to hear about it and and find out. It's it's usually whenever you guys come out with something, it's always something good. So. Uh, I'm already excited about it. Uh, there's a lot. There's a lot of questions. I'm gonna try to get to them all, but tonight we have a lot of questions in the comments section on our Facebook feed. Um, another random question here. We're talking about design. You're talking about you know the packaging and all that. Who who makes LFD boxes? Do you guys manufacture all of your own packaging in your boxes, or do you, is that from someone else? 
No, so there's, uh, you know, the, the, the town where we make our cigars, Tamboril, which is kind of like, uh, at least as uh, when it comes to Dominican cigars, is kind of like the mecca of, of the industry, you know. Um, there's there's a lot of box suppliers around and, and uh, a lot of really good ones. Um, so we, we have our partners that we've been working with for, for many years. Yeah. I know, I know that earlier this year, um, you know, when the pandemic really took hold early in the spring, um, this is almost kind of, this kind of lead into my next question too, but I know that you guys actually for a little while, you, you were shipping, um, some of your cigars, especially your Andalusian bulls, especially were starting to come in in bundles because oh. the box factory was closed. So, uh, I know that you guys have, you know, had your issues with that. And I, I, I'm almost, you guys are obviously probably, um, back into your boxes again your box factories are open um aside from that cigars specifically i know this has been a topic of conversation on other forums and stuff like that but with lfd um specifically are you guys anticipating already seeing maybe going to avoid any shortages on cigar production um availability for the consumer whether it's now or if it's going to be coming up as you you know start to kind of work through the rest of this pandemic um i i mean it's it, the 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 reality is that you know we we the factory was shut down for uh it was shut down for over a month and it when it started it started at you know under 50 percent capacity it was probably something like 30 and 35 percent capacity uh we've slowly expanded a little bit we're probably at about 60 percent capacity um and it's it's tougher to go much further above that just because you know we're i mean we're we're taking the the correct precautions you know so we're, we're we have to space people out and, and we're doing it because it's the right thing to do um and but you know, we only have so much space so if you're if you're spacing everybody out it, you can only fit so many man it is what it is um so so yeah production is is not what it was this, this time last year uh but demand seems to be there uh, just the same. So, you know, we're trying our best to keep up, but, uh, yeah, there, there, there could be some shortages here and there. There could be. There's another question that I saw here earlier and I'm not sure where it is. Sorry if I'm, I'm just trying to find it. Someone asked a really interesting question that I think you would be able to answer really well. Uh, I can't find it, but I, I believe the question was somewhere along the lines of what is the most difficult cigar to blend? uh that's a good question um cigar blending is it's it's a weird kind of fickle random thing man you know because there are some cigars that is at least and i can't speak for everybody who's ever blended a cigar but at least you know this is the way i kind of look at it usually there's something that inspires you it's maybe a shape or maybe it's a wrapper or maybe it's a filler or something that inspired you and now you want to create something around that uh, you do your best to mentally create the blend and imagine what it's going to be like, write it down on paper, have it made, you smoke it. Sometimes you're right. And sometimes you're totally off, you know? Um, and you know, there, there's, for example, and, and this is always an interesting one to me, like for example, Lenox, Lenox, um, and I, I don't say this to, uh, don't take this as I'm any kind <laughs> of mastermind because of that. <laughs> you know, this is just pure luck. Lenox, Lenox was right on the first blend. You know, I, I wrote that blend down on paper, you know, and you always write the first blend down as just like, okay, a starting point, then we'll take it from there. Yeah. And I wrote that blend down, they made it for me, I smoked it, it was, I, I didn't see anything that I wanted to change in it. And that never happened before or after, believe me. You know, usually it, it takes much more than that. But that was just luck, man. It was just pure luck. I got it right on the first try. The cigar that I was just talking about that we'll be releasing next year uh, was definitely the biggest pain in the ass. For me. <laughs> I think I've, I've probably gone through something like 50 blends for it um, until I finally said, okay, it's this is it. This is the one. It's perfect. It's what I wanted. Um, so I, I do. It could take 50 tries. It could take one. It could take somewhere in between. Uh at least for me, in my experience in blending cigars, that's that's how that's been. So we all know now that your favorite cigar to smoke from LFD 
is the one that you're holding right now, which is unobtainable for everyone else. <laughs> but if you had to pick a cigar that's from the line that is available, uh, sure. what would you say your favorite one is to smoke yourself personally? Um, I love the, the Lenox, both in the, the big size and the petite. Um, also, there's a cigar that you know a lot of people don't know about. It's uh, the Cameroon Cabinet Number no. Three, uh, formerly the 2000 series Number no. Three, uh, which is the cigar that if you've ever seen, met my old man or seen him at, at events, it's the little box press cigar that he's always smoking. It's like he smokes it religiously. And uh, so you know when I started smoking cigars, that's that's the first cigar I started smoking because you know that's what he always had around him. So that but that cigar is very special to me. It's very dear to me, and I I still smoke a lot of them. Um, so those would probably be the cigars that I smoke the most, um, would be, yeah, would be those. There's, um, there's a lot of different manufacturers out there and they all do different things. You know, you have, uh, you, you have the Perdomos who pretty much just kind of make, you know, their, their core lines, which, you know, great cigars is a great company. Um, but you know, they kind of have their core lines and you have, you know, like the Fuentes and they have their whole Opus X thing with yeah. all of their rare mystical cigars which you know I'll, I'll admit i smoke i i enjoy too lfd you're kind of in the same boat you guys have some kind of quirky rare cigars you know the solomon unicos you have um the cigar formerly known as m <laughs> you have the andalusian bulls uh what would you say is your what kind of what what, what inspiration goes into making a cigar like that that's more of a limited release special release kind of unique shape those 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 oddities that people are often looking for. What, what kind of inspiration goes into making something like that? Dude, it's you know it's it's that's just us having fun, man. You know, um, you know I, I think I think the coolest thing about LFD is that is that we don't have a long history or tradition, right? So my father started the company in the in the in the mid '90s, uh, just this you know which. What at the time was an absurd idea to to start a cigar <laughs> company. It didn't make any sense. This was right before the cigar boom, uh, and it was an industry dominated by families that have been in it for generations. You know, there was no newcomers. Nobody opened factories at that time. Uh, so for him to do it was it really was insane. You know, um, but so you know, it's obviously tradition is nice. You know, it's there's there's. A lot of you know, like you said, Fuente or, or Padron or Davidoff, these very long storied companies, and you know they have these brands that are you know they're they're strong, they carry a lot of weight, and it's because of all the time behind them and the tradition behind it. Um, and but I think you know what's cool about LFD is that we didn't try to imitate that, you know, because. You just see new brands all the time, and, and you feel like they're trying to imitate, you know, the uh, the the old big powerhouses, the traditional companies, and I don't see any point in that because you know we're not going to recreate that. We, you can't be that. That's that takes time, right? So why not create your own identity? Do something different, you know? And I think you know my father by by virtue of not having a tradition to follow was able to create his own, you know, and uh, he's a very creative guy, you know, the chisel and the El Jaco and the, and the cigar formerly known as M, things like that. I, I think, you know, he always wanted to just have fun and do different things uh, and, and create his own kind of tradition. And, you know, which inspires me a lot, you know, because when I got into, uh, you know, when I got into the, the creative side of the company, you know, I, I just let my imagination run wild too, you know, and we just, it's just fun to come up with stuff, man. And you just get random ideas from different places and they just pop up. You, you never know when a good idea is going to pop up. You know, you could be driving your car somewhere. You could be closing your eyes to go to sleep one night and, and something comes up. And uh, I think we have the freedom to, to do that stuff, you know, and I think that's cool. I think that's the coolest thing about LFD is that we're unique, you know, we, we do creative stuff and, uh, and you know so it's it's fun for us and that's and that i guess i don't know if that answers your question but oh no, yeah no it does it's always a thing i like having these conversations with with people such as yourself and, the, and companies such as lfd um who you know they 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 have those things in the line they or they do things that are a little bit different it's interesting to just kind of see like you know what goes into that and it sounds to me like you guys are just kind of you coming up with ideas and like, hey, let's do it. And there's there's companies out there will be like, hey, here's a here's a crazy idea. And then someone's like, nah, 
Let's just right. stick to what we know. And you guys are like, well, no, let's try it. Like, yeah. well, what are, you know, what do we got to lose? We'll make it. And, yeah. you know, then it becomes a hit. And you're like, well, look at that, that crazy idea. And it became something. Um, kind of like, you know, I have in front of me the uh, the Andalusian bull, the, the standard size uh-huh. um, that most people are probably familiar with, uh, which is a fantastic cigar. Going into the cigar, was this a cigar that you guys anticipated being kind of having the kind of the cult following that it has or is this just another blend that you guys are coming up with that you were like hey we're going to make this and whatever and now it's kind of turned into this cult thing where everyone's like oh indelusion bull indelusion bull uh what what happened with the bull could have never been predicted you know i mean we, we <laughs> the cigar it was a beautiful cigar you know the the blend everything we love we wouldn't release something unless we loved it so we love the cigar but you know it's a big cigar it's uh, it's a bit of a higher price point, so you know going into it, uh, I mean at least I was thinking this is not going to be you know our our most in demand cigar in the world. This is going to be a cigar that you know people say for special occasions, for you know for special moments, and uh, and then it got number one cigar of the year, and the rest is history. But no, uh, we could have never predicted what ended up happening with that cigar. No, I and think it's a. Gr- let me, oh, let me tell you something right now. The, the Andalusian Bull is proof that Cigar Aficionado's ratings are not rigged. And let me explain. <laughs> that, right? First off, first off, if you could buy a ranking in Cigar Aficionado's top 25, we would not be able to afford it. We're not a big company. We have much bigger competitors who would f- be able to far outbid us for any position on the top 25. Second... If we could, let's say hypothetically, we could buy that number one spot, I sure as hell would not have picked the Andalusian Bull, right? I would have picked <laughs> Robusto, Lajero Robusto, the 300, something easy, normal to make. Uh, I would have gone with something like that, you know? So I just want to throw that out there because there's always the conspiracy theories and all that, but that's it doesn't work that way. Would you say that that number one ranking – is really what kind of blew Andalusian Bull out of the water and all of a sudden it became the, the overnight sensation was just that because it brought that notoriety to it. Yeah, absolutely, man. You, you know, uh, the, the thing is, uh, there's a lot of people, at least up to that point, you know, there's there's a lot of people that had never heard of La Froda Dominicana, you know? Um, and, you know, a lot of everyday smokers and people that are in the shops all the time and, and in the blogs and the communities, that might be kind of weird for them to hear, but... The average smoker, you know, they might smoke one a week or whatever. You know, a lot of these people never heard of La Foto Dominicana, you know. Uh, and then you get number one cigar of the year in Cigar Aficionado. Now at least everybody's heard of it, you know. Um, and it gives them, you know, a lot of people say, hey, let me give it a try. Uh, and if they like it, they'll go back to it. If they don't, then that's it, you know. But they'll give it a try. And so that's what happens, man. You know, that number one ranking, it gives you an opportunity. And then it's up to you. You know, if, if the cigar is good, people will come back to it. If it's not, they won't. And that's it. So it was just the perfect storm of we got that blessing of a uh, number one cigar of the year. And then for the most part, and of course, there's a lot of people that, that don't like it. But for the most part, people agreed that it was deserving of the accolades. And then it just it just blew up, man. It became something that we could have never imagined I think that it's a fantastic cigar. A big fan of it myself. Um, another cigar that is more available, but I would say is, from what I understand, a little bit more on the. It's more on the limited side that I really enjoy. Which actually I was told is similar to the blend of the um, uh, the Andalusian Bull is the the tw- the twenty fifth anniversary, sure. the golden. That's a fantastic cigar. Uh, I was actually going to smoke one tonight. I don't know if I brought it out with me. Um, I was going to smoke it, and I was kind of, and I brought a bowl out, and I brought the El Grenou out, and I was kind of going back and forth, and I couldn't decide. They're all good. I've had them all before, and um, I ended up going with the El Grenou, but they're all fantastic. And that's one of the things I, I do have with LFD is, you know, I have the, I have a, a good assortment of all the cigars, and I'm always like, ah, I want an LFD, but I can't decide. And I guess that's a good problem to have. You know, you want to, you, you know, you want to, oh, well, they're all good. You know, I want to smoke them all, but I can only have one. Uh, yeah. versus being like, well, this is the good one. These are okay. I'll go with this one. So um, for me, is and another one that I think is fantastic is the Colorado Escuro. That's a new one for me. I started yeah. smoking that one this year. That's a really good cigar, and I think it's a little it's a little bit different 
in terms of you know my experience with it, I think it's a little bit different than a lot of the other stuff you guys make. Um, I think that it's it's uh, oh, I've lost my train of thought here again. Um, but you know, it, it's a little it's a little bit different. I think it has a much different flavor profile. Uh, it's it's different than you know like the the hero line, the double hero line, um, sure. which are all great. I mean, you guys and you guys have some some crazy stuff in there. I mean, you have the diggers, which are insane. <laughs> um, I actually smoked one of those. Last week we did the uh, I was there for the gourmet smoke ses- uh, gourmet smoke sessions with John, um, who by the way I don't know where John went but he, he disappeared <laughs> on us I don't even know if he's in here right now I'm not showing him up on the roster. We're um, giving him attention. I, think. <laughs> I was interested because he was like, well I have some questions I'm going to ask Tony too and I'm like, oh this is going to be good, and now he's not even here so I don't know you know what he's probably cooking again he always you know he disappears he's probably cooking a steak who knows. Um, having oh he actually commented just as i said that having a blast on the show tonight he's having a blast on the show but he's not on the show right now <sighs> being sarcastic was that a little backhanded <laughs> tony does he pull these shenanigans at work too like is this i told him i was going to ask ask you all about his his work performance as well <laughs> uh, let me tell you about john i i i I couldn't imagine a better person for his job. Like we, John, we struck gold with John. He's a, uh, uh, for what he is, you know, is, is, is the, the chief of our, our sales staff and handles all of our sales in the country. He's, you know, honestly, he's, he's more people know him than, than know me. You know, he, he, he goes to way more shops than I do is way, does way more events than I do. Uh, so he is one of the major faces of our company, and uh, he's he's fantastic at it, man. He he really loves going out there, shaking hands, meeting people, and and uh, spreading the good word, man. He's great at it. So, John, wherever you are, love you, man. I think he just, he had just come in and he said, "Computer died. Rest in peace." I don't know if he's trying to fight his way back. I don't know what he's doing, but hopefully hopefully he jumps back in here soon. I don't know what happened, but um, no, I I would say. You know, kind of what you were saying. He is, you know, in all, in in all, you know, and again, we're always kind of saying this whole like, you know, because he, you know, he works for you guys and he's on the show with me, and a lot of people might say like, well, you're only saying that because John's on your show. No, John, and we've said this before. All of the LFD cigars that I smoke, I buy them. I don't get them from John. Uh, there was a show we did a few months ago. He stayed at my house for a few days. Um, we were actually at a shop that day. I bought a box of Andalusian bowls and then I gave him one. Like I, I didn't just like, Oh, like John hooks me up. Like, no, I bought them and gave him one. Uh, John's been a good friend. John's a great guy to have around. I, as, oh, we're getting a little bit of behind the scenes makeup there. studio. I think. Yeah. This is where he, uh, what's going. I've seen all sorts of stuff going on over here. I think nothing's work. Nothing's working tonight. So, <laughs> so my computer, which I just got back, by the way, thank you. For you got to flip that phone around. We're looking at your American flag Crocs. Not that, you know, wrong with it. Well, I'm trying. Here's the thing. The flip's not working. It's not allowing me to flip <laughs> the actual device around. So my computer, which I just had fixed, which is also brand new, um, officially is dead. It just died. It's not a battery issue. It's just dead. And then now yeah. the uh, now the phone's not working. So I don't really know what's going on here. Like, I'm not showing anything. Oh, here we go. There you are. Oh, nice. Oh, and we're seeing the stool again. Oh, there Perfect. it is. There we yeah, go. No, it's been a really rough show for me. Uh, <laughs> I did catch. I mean, I did catch a little bit of it. So thank you guys for the kind words. Um, but yeah, it worked out well. It worked out well. Yeah, uh, computer's dead. So uh, Tony and I actually have an event we're doing together tomorrow night. A virtual uh, cigar symposium, essentially. It's called the Night in Santiago with a retailer out of Jersey. Um, and the computer is vitally important uh, to that presentation. So yeah. in my absence, I made an appointment to the Apple store. Uh, fortunately, you've got two Apple computers at the tobacco estates. Uh, so you guys got backups. I don't have any backups. So if it's not there, I'm done. So we'll figure that out tomorrow. Yeah, my, same thing happened with my laptop. Uh, John and I have the same laptop. Uh, you know, we both use the MacBook Pro. And his he his died earlier this year. We have not I have a hard time. This year, I've only had it for two months. It died two weeks after. Well, I no, you had you had the other one that you were having issues with earlier yeah, in the year. Yeah. And then you got another one. And then all of a sudden, mine randomly just wouldn't start one day and it died. And like $600 later, I have that fixed and it's currently running now. Now you get a new laptop. Now that one's, 
it died, you had it fixed, and it's dead again. I don't know what's going on here, but... It, it was foreshadowing because it's, <laughs> it kind of died this afternoon. And um, so I was like, ah, no big deal. It kind of died. So I was like, oh, maybe it was just a glitch. Not a glitch. It's, it's dead. Hope you got that Apple Care, dude. Oh, yeah, yeah. I got... I think I bought it twice. Like, I... I <laughs> so it was funny. So Apple... I went to take the computer in. They don't do a loaner computer program. So I said to the guy, I'm like, well, I need a computer. I do virtual broadcasts. Like I broadcast shows. I go 90, 99% of what I do on a daily basis is on this computer. Um, and the guy's like, well, he goes, you can buy one. He goes, and then return it in like 14 days. You have 15 days to return it. So in the Apple store, instead of having like a loaner program, by the way, which everything's in the cloud, so they could loan you a computer. It would act like your computer for the extended period of time they let you buy one and then return it it makes absolutely zero sense so there's an interesting question it's a two-part question uh in the comments section i wanted to bring this up from michael mccaskill who question one is is lfd going to open for factory tours at any near point would love to go back to the dominican um that's question number one and question number two is by the way is tony still um I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to paraphrase on this. Is Tony still with the, the hot girlfriend he had in February? So apparently <laughs> there's some interest in your girlfriend. People want to know if you guys are still together. I don't know anything about that, but that's what's being asked right now. <laughs> uh, dude, that's what's being asked. That's the answer. Um, we are, we're not currently doing tours. We are uh, keeping the presence of people at our factory to, uh, people that need to be there uh, until the global situation changes. That should be a policy. So, uh, no, unfortunately, no tours as much as we love having people over. And, you know, I know people love coming over. We can't do it right now. Uh, it's not correct. And uh, as for, yeah, I, <laughs> I had a girlfriend in February and I still have her. Yes. I, uh, I don't, I don't mean to put you on the spot. I just, I, I, I read them can, off. Can we, can we get like well, who's the one that asked the question? She's gonna be very happy to hear about that question. <laughs> yeah, I'm curious, like who asked who asked the question? Like was like was it like a like a, a proxy version of her that was asking the question, or was this somebody else? It's probably a catfish account. She doesn't have the link. She doesn't have the link. She and I, I don't know. She's she's not the most tech savvy, so I don't think she would have figured it out. <laughs> uh. Jonathan, what are you smoking and drinking? I think we already covered that. Um, oh, well, drinking. I'm uh, I'm drinking a I'm drinking a Chianti right now, just a just a Italian table wine, and um, I already I already washed up the amount of decaf coffee I'm allowed to drink. They had three decaf coffees earlier, mm. so I'm not doing so. I so it's funny. I don't know if you saw this. There was another show that I was on recently where we did strong cigars. And we smoked the NAS, which I don't think you've actually had, Matthew. Have you had the NAS yet? I mean, you would know if you had it. It's not I don't think so. Yeah, yeah, no, so. I don't think so, no. So it's, it's 100% Lijero, right, Tony? So mm -hmm. it's the strongest cigar that we make. And it's not really a cigar. It's, it's a cheroot. It's, it's a creamy old cheroot. Um, NAS stands for nasty as shit. So. <laughs> So I was on this podcast, and we were doing strong cigars with strong drinks. So I think they had, like, Stag Jr. or something like that. And then we had NAS. So we got on the show, and I'm like, I'm not going to smoke NAS because I'm going to get lit up like a Christmas tree. I go, and I'm not going to drink Stag Jr. because I'm that stuff's just too strong for me. I'm not, you know, I'm not a massive bourbon guy. It's one but, of my favorites. So we get on the show, and I make it, like, 15 minutes until they ask me what I'm smoking. And I'm like, so, Carney, like, what are you smoking? And I'm like, well, you know, I go, you know, guys, I'm not as tough as you. I'm smoking something a little more medium body. I, I have, like, a Cameroon cabinet. And uh, they're like, oh, come on, man, it's the NAS show. They're like, they're like, but they're like, what are you drinking, man? They're like, they build me up like I'm this tough guy. Like, what are you drinking? I go, I'm, I'm drinking a decaf cappuccino. <laughs> <laughs> so they're like, why do we even have you on this show? I said, no, guys, I'm enjoying watching you do it. That's fine. You know, I don't have to do that. Uh, but it was pretty funny, so yeah, but no, I am actually drinking some alcohol tonight, a little bit of red wine, Chianti. <laughs> John, uh, you, uh, one of the things I know about you is you don't have, you don't, you don't drink any caffeine, you're not really a liquor guy, 
um, mostly just a wine guy. And I kind of miss, I was reminiscing the other day, um, as it kind of gets a little bit cooler, you know, up here in the Northeast again, uh, the beginning of the show back in May. And, uh, we had our, our first series of episodes when we were still kind of hunkered down in the quarantine. You were up in Maine. I was down, you know, obviously down here at the tobacco estate and you were, uh, you were getting real. I just remember you were get really getting into the box wine at the grocery store. And that was like, that was like the thing for a while. And, uh, now you're, you're back into the bottled wine yeah. again, yeah. which is interesting. Yeah. yeah. That you was, know, the, you got to turn some stuff around a little bit, but you know, John, oh, yeah, John used to be a liquor guy. When I met John, <laughs> he was a liquor guy. He was very I much was a liquor guy, which is probably why he's no longer a liquor guy. <laughs> I was trying to change the conversation before we got into that. I uh, used to be exclusively a liquor guy. Uh, ah. Exclusive. Um, and I actually had a vodka soda last week for the first time in probably four or five years, and I couldn't even stomach it anymore. I'd, I'd, I'd hit my limit on that. But, Tony, I, I um, when you're blending a cigar... What is the first thing that you do? What's the first step of your process when you're getting ready to blend a cigar and pretend like it's an even, there's nothing going on. You haven't decided on what you're going to do. You haven't decided on the brand. You haven't decided anything. What's the very first step in the creation of a cigar for you? Sure. Uh, well, um, dude, it's, it's, there's not one definitive first step. Like for example, uh, let's say Lenox. Lenox was created because one of our tobacco distributors started getting this this leaf from Brazil. Um, this this uh, this seed that they call Fubra. Um, and I got a sample of it, smoked it, and I loved it. It was awesome. And I said, I want to build a blend around this. It had these like really dark characteristics. You know, this kind of like uh, dark chocolate, roasted coffee type type flavor going to it they all wanted, wanted to build something around that so we built i the blend i wrote down was you know i want to create a dark cigar not so much on the spice or the the tangy flavors or anything like that i want i want dark flavors you know i want dark chocolate i want coffee i want that stuff uh and that's also how the name and the whole theme and the packaging came about was you know a reflection of the flavors in the blend uh but the bowl for example uh, the bowl started off with the shape, you know, we first we saw a shape that we wanted and uh, and then, all right, let's create a cigar with this shape, you know, and then the shape led first to the packaging and the packaging kind of inspired what, you know, so I, I, I the bowl has a good story, actually. So my father was in Belgium. Um, he was doing events and, you know, with our distributor out there. And, but he took an afternoon off to go visit um, a good friend of ours, Fred, the owner of Jay Cortez, uh, which is, you might not know Jay Cortez, they're, they're more of a machine-made company based out in Europe, but they're the ones that bought Oliva, right? So that's, that's how you might know them in, in the premium side of things. You know, but Fred's a good friend of ours, has been for a long time, so my, friend, my dad wanted to go visit Fred at, at the factory. Uh, so he took the afternoon off, went there, they were in his office shooting the shit, um, Fred, for one reason or another, had to get up and go take care of something. Uh, and uh, he, uh, he left my father alone in his office, uh, which was a mistake. And uh, so my father started snooping around and he found this old wooden mold that he had somewhere in the office. I don't know what it was ever used for, but it was there, it was really old mold and it had this shape, you know? And he took a picture of it, <laughs> he sent it to me and we thought that's a really cool shape. We should do something with that. Uh, and then, you know, just my mind got to thinking. I was looking at the shape. It reminded me of something powerful, like a bowl. Uh, and I said, okay, a bowl, but you know, that's kind of been done before. How can we do it differently? And then just the name Andalusian Bowl popped into my head, you know, because Andalusia is kind of the mecca for bullfighting in Spain. Uh, and it had a nice ring to it. And so, you know, all right, so th these would be the colors, you know, the Andalusian flag has the green, we put the bullfighter there, the font is based on uh, Pablo Picasso's handwriting, you know, he was from Andalusia, he painted a lot of bulls, uh, so, you know, the whole theme of the packaging, it all came together, and, you know, we had the shape and we had the packaging before we had the blend, you know, mm -hmm. and then, you know, you're looking at the packaging and all that and, and, and the name and everything, and then you in i guess in some kind of abstract way imagine what the flavors should be for it 
you know, and then we started blending it and that's what eventually came out, you know, so uh, like I said, the, the inspiration is, is it can come from a lot of different directions and then, you know, uh, so there's, there's not really one first step, I wouldn't say. So, Tony, another question we have uh, from our friend Agnes, who's a uh, big fan of the show. John and I know her very well. Uh, wants to know, besides cigars, LFD, uh, and everything you do in the industry, uh, what other passions do you have in life? What do you do to get away from cigars sometimes? You just need some, some downtime. Sure. Um, I like to read. Uh, you know, I like photography. I like, uh, you know, I, uh, creative stuff is is what I like. You know, um, and uh, I like to cook. Um, I've gotten much better at it since March, um, to the point where now I'm not embarrassed to cook for people. So I, I do enjoy it a lot. And uh, but you know, I, you know, just socializing. I have my friends, traveling, whatever. You know, things like what that. Yeah, just like to enjoy life, basically. I mean, and you seem like a very creative guy, um, down to earth guy, very cool guy. You know, that's that's the things you know you like to see. And this, the cigar community is a lot of people like that, just cool people. You know, yeah. and that's that's what it's that's that's what it's all about. You know, smoking cigars yeah. with each other, being social. Nobody likes that one guy who sits in the the back of the lounge and <laughs> doesn't want to socialize. It's like, what are you doing here? Um, the cigar lounge experience is about being social. Um, yeah, no, we uh, we we do have uh, our cigar news segment uh, that we have to jump into. I was not paying attention to the time. Um, so, cigar news brought to you by McAuliffe Cigars. McAuliffe Cigars, if you are not an ambassador, you should be one. Head over to their website and sign up today. Um, it's election week. We've already kind of touched on it. Um, so, I mean, a little... little political here uh obviously there's been some states that are now increasing their cigar taxes the state of oregon and the state of colorado have increased their cigar taxes uh i don't remember exactly what the percentages were but i believe colorado is like 52 percent john i don't know if that's and then i think it's going to go up even more uh in 2021 that up closer to 70 percent um you're gonna you're gonna see a lot of significant increases on things they call like sin tax um, not syntax, like in creation of a sentence, but like sin, S-I-N, tax. And you're going to see a lot of that. These states have massive budget shortfalls because of the closures. Um, you know, states like Maine, for example, that thrive off tourism, and it's hundreds of millions of tax dollars that aren't in those states. And that's that's everywhere. Now, you still have people that create commerce to, uh, locally, uh, but they depend on, you know, Florida's another one. You depend on people state um you know florida is unique because they have an influx of population here but there's going to be an increase on taxes and, and tobacco has always been an easy target and cigars are also an easy target um, so i venture to say you know i, I know this is positive people don't like it but there's some things that are real and true uh, you know tobacco taxes are going to go up cigar taxes are going to go up in the states uh, because they're going to try to create revenue and most of these states won't balance the budget by any means and the taxes will never come back down once they uh, recover it, but uh, they you're going to see some increases in tax, so it's not surprising uh, that you've seen those in some referendums now, and you know, expect to see those more in the future too. How does obviously this is stuff that happens in real time? It happens every day. It's it's beyond your control, but you know, as you know, two guys at the top of a of a manufacturer. This is a good question for. How, how does that go into your your pricing consideration. I mean, obviously, you know, when you guys, you know, you, you do your price increases or you price a new product or whatever, you're coming up with pricing. Um, you know, there, there's things that you guys, you know, put into that so you can make profit and all that. And I get that. that's part of business. But, you know, do you take in the cigar taxes in most of these states that are very high? I mean, does that come into play when you're trying to put a price on an item or on a new product? Yeah, yeah well, the cost, of, the cost of selling a good how that's going to cost the cost of goods sold for a retailer essentially where the taxes are going to impact and we pay s chip import fees and import taxes and whatnot um but when you're ever you're pricing a product you're you are paying attention to what the taxes may be on it um on a state by state state basis you essentially have a, pr a price threshold for a product so you know say you know tony and Lido develop a product and we sit and talk about the pricing obviously the cost of goods and what that costs us to get it here is important but then we're also we are looking at 
I mean, what the quality of product is or what the brand itself is, um, you know, back with. So, yeah, you're, you're building a price threshold, essentially, of what that product can actually sell at as a, as a top or bottom. And we, we try to come somewhere in, in between. You know, we, we're not trying to have the most expensive cigars. We're not trying to have the least expensive cigars. And fortunately, the quality and consistency of the product lends ourselves to do that. But if you look at, like, a 700 Maduro, which is our number one selling skew, one of the biggest issues with that cigar and why it's back ordered so regularly is because the price is very fair. It's under ten dollars. There's not a lot of under ten dollars cigars like that that are six and a half by sixty ring gauge with that quality and consistency in the marketplace. So you have a cigar that's very fairly priced, uh, that's very price conscious at the same time. So yeah, that does go into that. Taxes not as much, uh, but it's something that. Uh, that we are aware of and that we do pay attention to, but the taxes don't traditionally impact on our end, on the state level, what we're going to do necessarily with the cigar, uh, because everyone's competing with the same tax in each state. So as long as you're uh, looking at what's going to happen when you import it in the country and price it with an MSRP, you're generally going to be competing at the same level with your competitors because the taxes go state to state. Right. Yeah, and unfortunately, this is fair price. You know, we we we. Try to put a fair price on our products. You know, we put a lot of work into them. You know, we own our own farm, we own our own factory, we have a lot of operating costs, and we don't we don't cut corners when it comes to spending money to make sure things are good. And we're not afraid to reject cigars. So you know, we're we uh, you know we, we we have there's a lot of costs behind this, and we we try to give a fair price for the for the product for what it is and for what goes into it. You know. You know, and, and one thing, too, we do look at, um, you know, inflation is a real thing. If you look at what an LFD cigar cost 10 years ago, the price of the cigar is actually less compared to what it was 10 years ago based off of inflation. Uh, so we don't overcorrect it. We try to keep it fair throughout. Um, you know, and, you know, I've done the math. Uh, we're actually behind. If we, if we just inflated prices with the uh, with inflation of the United States market and the economy, Oh, our cigars would be much more expensive than they are now, so we're actually behind uh, what they were what they were priced at ten years ago. It's actually a great one for the sales staff. You know, if a retail ever complains about pricing, you're like, hey, we're behind inflation, bud. <laughs> hey, you know, I, I may or may not have done that before. <laughs> uh, but it, it, it's funny when you bring that up because that's a real thing. Like, yeah. That's real. It's something people don't really think of. And, uh, you know, inflation's a real thing. A dollar doesn't cost the same. A dollar's not worth the same as it was yeah. five years ago, ten years ago. Um, you know, those things change, and inflation's real. And and that's something that we, you know, we pay attention to when we do price increases. We want to make sure that it's fair. And, and I think, you know, I think we're more than fair um, in that regard. So when I look skew for skew, uh, you know, when you plug it into the inflation, uh, the Florida Dominicana is priced even more fair uh, now than it, than it ever was. Yeah. And then, of course, there, there's the significant investment that goes into just at least the attempt to fight this stuff. You know, I mean, the CRA and all the money that we donate to politicians, and uh, it, it's it's a lot. It's a, and it's it's a very small amount of companies that are putting up the majority of this money. You know, we're one of them, uh, and we're putting up more money than you know companies that are proportionally much bigger. You know, so. Uh, that's, that's something I have to talk yeah, and, and since you bring that up, we also, I mean, this is, I guess, also kind of news. If you don't really follow it, uh, we want to give a shout out to Glenn Loop from the Scar Rights of America. He is, um, as of yesterday, Election Day, he has now officially um, stepped away from his role at the, uh, at the helm of the Scar Rights of America. So we wish him all the best. Great guy. We had him on the show earlier this year. Uh, it was a great episode. Um, if you if you didn't see it. Go back and check us out Facebook, YouTube, and and find that episode and watch it. It was, it was a really good episode. And if you're really into the the political side of the industry, if that if that kind of interests you, I mean, a lot of good stuff came out of that conversation, you know, uh, with him. And we had a great time. A lot of a lot of information there. Um, with that, we're also going to change gears really quickly. I see we're we're kind of running out of time, so I want to switch gears really quickly, and I want to head over to our uh, our sports segment. Um, I guess we have a little bit to talk about, mostly football. Uh, that's going to be brought to you by Nova Cigar. Platinum Nova, make Nova big. Um, John and I are Patriots fans, and uh, this has been the real uh, this has been a real kick in the teeth for us this year. 
A long uh, time coming. Long I can see Tony. Coming. Tony's very happy about it. <laughs> yeah. I've been a miserable Dolphins fan my whole life, and I actually like my team for the first time, and I couldn't tell you how long. They actually can play football. It's amazing. It's it's like I'm watching it. I'm just like, yeah. I don't believe it. it and they're well and they're, and they're well coached. Uh, Flores is a yeah. really good coach. They, it's the best product they put on the field for over a decade. They're playing like you know. I mean, I, not yet, but it's a it's clearly a patriot esque foundation that he's building. You know, it's it's clearly all Belichick. It's got it's got Belichick written all over. You know, it's and I love seeing it, man. I'm excited about the future for the Dolphins. Dolphins are second place. Second place. Yeah, second place behind the Bills, who uh, we just lost to. I, and, you uh, know what? I always thought on the on the point of the Dolphins, I always thought it was unfortunate that they lost Mika Fitzpatrick last year. I think Flores is a big defensive coach, and you mentioned like the Patriots, the Belichick way. Obviously, Flores has that, and they have a guy at the helm now that's the future quarterback, barring any issues with Tua. Well, it's a Nick it's a, it's a Nick great. Yeah, it's a Nick Saban guy. So you got these, you got this Bama player, and I mean, Fitzpatrick is arguably the best defensive back in the league, um, or at least top five. So I, you know, they, they ended up getting rid of him. I know he was unhappy last year. The team sucked. But he was a young guy, and you know, I felt like that. You know, as the Dolphins turn it around, they're going to need a player like that. Dude, he would have, he would have been, he would have been putting up numbers on this defense. That's a mm-hmm. shame. And, and, you know, he's doing great in Pittsburgh, and Pittsburgh is out of control. They're, they're undefeated for the first time since, like, the 70s. Um, wow. The team's ridiculous all over the place. Big Ben's not injured at all. He's in great health. The receivers are good. Um, their defense is, is scary, scary good. And they just win. They win all kinds of games. Like, I, I can't stand the Steelers. Um, but they, they win every kind of football game. Like, this year, they've won it all. They've come back. They've blown people out. Um, they're just a, the teams that can win any kind of game tend to do great um, in the NFL. Um, so I, I think Pittsburgh is quietly, for some reason, yeah, quietly, right. in my opinion, the favorite. Like, everybody talks about the Seahawks, this, that. Uh, I just had a conversation today, and like five, t- five teams were said before I was like, wait a minute. I'm like, Pittsburgh <laughs> is ridiculous. It's a, you know what? And, and I, I've always loved Big Ben, and I'll tell you why. Because every time you see him on the field, he looks like he just had a beer and a cheeseburger. Because <laughs> he probably did. <laughs> he's, like the, he's like the David Wells of like the NFL, only he's got two championships. But I guess David Wells had a bunch of them, too. But yeah, but yeah you wouldn't be shocked that like Big Ben had – I call him SpongeBob SquarePants. My, my mother and I call him because he looks like SpongeBob. Um, <laughs> but you wouldn't be shocked like if he was like at the end of his career, if he came out. And was, was like, oh, yeah, man, I played every game hammer. You know, you wouldn't be shocked. <laughs> uh, you know, it was like, I, I, I think the, the Pittsburgh the teams that are like that anyway, like Ike Taylor, when he retired, said he used to listen uh, to music uh, in his headphones uh, during the game. <laughs> and, you know, so it wouldn't shock you if Big Ben was, was like, hey, man, I, got, I won that Super Bowl drunk. Because he looks it. He looks drunk. He always comes in out of shape. Um, <laughs> he's just a big dude. Uh, yeah, I mean, so Steelers are looking good. Of course, there's the Buccaneers, who are looking pretty good. They're Tom yeah. Brady at the helm. Yeah. Uh, I guess, I think it's John, and John will probably disagree with me here, but I think it's safe to say that we're past the point where I think we can now say it's it was more Brady. Not just, now, it's not, I'm not discrediting Belichick and his leadership with the Patriots um, at all. Great leadership, the success, a huge part of it. But now that we've seen where the Patriots went post Brady and where Brady went with another team, um, I'm starting to feel like maybe it was more Brady. Dude, I, I, I have to yeah. eat some serious crow on this one because I've I've always thought it was like 60-40 Belichick or maybe 70-30 Belichick. I, I always thought he was the the just a genius. Not that he's not, he's still a fantastic coach. But I, I never gave Brady as much credit as. Now I feel like I probably should have because he's playing fantastic. When you look at that situation, so great players with a great coach win Super Bowls, right? Great yeah. players with great coaching. Um, you don't ever have a situation where you don't at least have a good coach and great players. Look at everyone that's won. 
Yeah. You know, people say, oh, well, Trent Dilfer won a Super Bowl. Yeah, they just happen to have probably one of the top five defenders, two of the top five defenders of all time on their team. Oh, one of the greatest Ed, defenders of all time. Yeah, period. Ed Reed, Ed Reed, Ray Lewis, and that's just naming two. You know, they have Hall of Famers all over the place. But you look at the Patriots, you're a great player, greatest of all time, arguably. Not arguably, be great. And you have the greatest of all time as a coach, and you're going to win a lot of games. And by the way, when you're a great player, you're actually playing the game. So if you're a great player, your greatness is going to follow where you go and what you do. Yeah. Your greatness ends when you stop playing. As a coach, your greatness is dependent on other people playing. And your coaching is very important. But if you don't have the right pieces, you're eventually going to have a year where it's just not as good. And by the way, the Patriots are having a rough year. But they haven't got blown out of any game except one this year. All those games were close. They could very easily only have one loss and just a few things went a different direction. It's just that their issue is bigger than, you know, New England people. Are like, oh, Cam Newton this. No, Cam Newton's not the problem. Obviously, he makes mistakes. Everybody's making mistakes. They're weak in so many spots. Their offensive line sucks. The biggest issue they had last year was their tight ends. They didn't improve. They suck. They have one tight end, and he's no good. Hizzo. So they didn't get better where they sucked the most. Their running backs were never a problem, but they loaded up on running back for some reason. Their wide receivers are just as bad as they were last year. Your best wide receiver and most, most consistent one is 34, 35 years old. It's long. That was asked him. And then the defense has six people that are out because of COVID, uh, you know, and just aren't playing this year. So the Patriots have a lot of issues. They can easily only have one loss. They can still make the playoffs. They just don't win out in the division, you know, and a few other things in the way. But they're not too far off, man. It's just everybody else was that much better than them when you take yeah. away the greatest player of all time. Yeah. Yeah. I way, mean, they might not be that much better with Brady this year. There's a reason why he left. And that Tampa Bay Buccaneers team is ridiculous. There's no way they're going to be able to keep it all together with all those no, players on that team. Very dumb. Team. Yeah, I, I would say, uh, I don't know, we're, we're about the halfway point of the season. Any any predictions for a Super Bowl matchup, or you think it's still too early? I, I'm going C, Seahawks, Bucks in the NFC Championship game. Okay. And I'm going to go... Um, I'm going to go Pittsburgh versus um, Pittsburgh versus Kansas City in the AFC Championship game, and I won't predict the Super Bowl. It's too early for that. Okay, that's fair. That's fair. Um, Tony, what do you think? I, I I can't disagree with that. I can't disagree with that. Um, my my wild card prediction is that the Dolphins will make the playoffs. You know, I'd just be happy seeing them in the playoffs. So. <laughs> I don't think that's too far fetched at this point right now either. And I'll, I'll I'll give you a prediction in two years. I think they're a serious contender for AFC Championship. Interesting. Well, I mean, it'll definitely help not having Tom Brady in the AFC East. That's two definitely years. that's that's definitely a load it's off of everybody. Well, see, hey, listen, I said at the beginning of the season, I said, I think the Dolphins in three years are going to be a real, legit, competitive team. I think this year they're going to be surprising. They're going to be a decent team. They're going to compete in every game. I didn't predict they would have a winning record necessarily, but they're doing a lot better than I thought they would already. Mm. So this is the trajectory. I think in two seasons, it's fair to say, they could be competing for the eighth time. Well, guys, we are getting towards the end of the show, um, getting ready to wind down here. It's been great. It's been fun. Tony, thank you for coming on the show with us. Thank you for being here with us. Um, you know, we appreciate you, you know, coming out and, uh, you know, sharing your wisdom with us. Um, John, as always, thank you for being here. Rocking the smoking tobacco shirt like a boss. And the Tim Tebow hat, believe, that we all need to believe right now. Um before we close out the show, um, closing closing statements. We'll go to Tony first. Anything you want to say? The floor is yours. Oh boy, it's a pretty nice spot. I got another to say, man. Uh, congratulations to you uh, uh, on the show. I think uh, you're you're an awesome moderator. You're, you've done a you've done an awesome job today. And from what I hear, the viewership is is uh, it's it's going great, huh? Oh, it's going really really good. Yeah. 
right. yeah they, uh, yeah thank you yeah no we've 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 been uh we've been really fortunate you know we we put in the work every week you know we uh we try to be a little bit serious about what we do over here and uh it's you always know, just 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 keep you know just keep just keep putting the the passion in you know the cigars is something that i obviously really love um you know we all do that's why that's why we're doing it um so it you know it means a lot to me and i put a lot into it um just you know thankful to have you know good people to be surrounded by you know john's been you know uh here with me since day one and i, I can't say enough about him and i can't thank him enough just for being a good friend being being so much help and uh and people like yourself, you know, who come on the show and, you know, give us, uh, give us the time of day, you know, let us, uh, let us, uh, you know, share, share that with everyone else. Uh, John, anything else you want to say? I know uh, last week we yeah. were, uh, we were, we were live on location for the yep. beginning of the Gourmet Smoke Sessions, and that went fantastic. Gourmet Smoke Session last week was awesome. It was a good break for us to smoke tobacco to, uh, to, to participate in that and then switch over to the Wednesday night. So thank you for those viewing with us on Wednesdays. We'll be going live Wednesdays at 7 from here on out. Uh, tomorrow, Tony and I will be live on Facebook Live and YouTube Live doing a night in Santiago, a virtual farm and factory tour. So for those who were watching, they were asking about how to tour the farm and factory. You can actually do it with us tomorrow um, at uh, 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time with uh, – Main Street Cigars of New Jersey. So that'll be live on uh, Facebook Live. It'll be on uh, on Facebook. It'll be on my Facebook. And then we'll also have it on YouTube Live on uh, Night in Santiago. Uh, LFD Cigars on YouTube. A little harder to find, but there is a link up online. Uh, it'll be on all those channels. And then we've got, um, you know, we've got, we've got Hacking Gourmet coming up uh, on the 9th, uh, November 9th, our first episode of November. Uh, that will be called Hackers of the Fall. We'll be uh, doing fall dishes. Uh, so we'll have that going and uh, we'll be announcing officially our next gourmet smoke session with LFB um, on November 19th. That'll be on Monday. We've already put some info out on there, but we'll have some more info on the actual cigar uh, on Monday. So, yeah, Night Santiago tomorrow night on Facebook Live. Hacking Gourmet Hackers of the Fall on Monday at 5 p.m. Eastern Time. And Smoking Tobacco on Wednesdays at 7 p.m. our new night. That's right. You can find us here live on Facebook. Don't forget to check us out on social media, on Instagram, Facebook, uh, YouTube, like and subscribe, all that fun stuff. Guys, we appreciate you watching every week. Uh, and thanks for, for coming out and, and watching us on our new night. Uh, I know we kind of tossed it up a little bit, but uh, it was just uh, we've we gotten a lot of questions about it. It's just easier for everyone, um, you know, especially Thursday nights, Friday nights, big event nights. So we want to be able to be accessible for those as well. Uh, so we had to move the show so that uh, we can kind of be involved in everything. So, uh, again, thank you guys for watching. Thank you, Tony, for coming on the show with us. Really appreciate it. And we'll see you guys all next week.